So, without further ado, I just want to introduce um, Professor Tim Brennan. He's from the College of Creative Arts in Wellington. And Tim um, is a real polymath. He has, works, he's, a, he's an artist, but he works across performance art and writing, and he's a historian, and I'm going to get out this. He's a curator because he just does it all. Um, contemporary artist, poet, historian, yeah, I said that, whose research includes performance art, photography, painting, artist, books. He works with place and text, photographs, painting, writing, and curating. Um, notable moments in his practice include work being presented at the 50th and 54th Venice Biennale. Um, he's been the writer and the artist in residence at the British Museum in London. He's been in festivals in, all across the UK and France and Canada and Quebec. Um, he's got 17 monograph publications contributed chapters to all kinds of journals. In 2007, he was shortlisted for the UK's Northern Art Prize. Um, we're actually really lucky to have Tim for lots of reasons. One of them is he won't be in New Zealand much longer. He's actually going to be moving to Manchester yeah, yeah. Um, to take up a position heading the art school there. So uh, this is his first time in Palmerston North. Uh, likely his last. Um, so um, <laughs> we're really, really lucky. If you've come today, you're, you're just here for a special treat. And I'll just testify real quick. I went to a workshop last night that Tim uh, gave at the library, the Palmerston North City Library, and it was just, uh, it was amazing. It, we just, we, we rambled over our own personal histories and his walking tours of various places around the world and his art books, and we talked about angels, and it was just miraculous, and I left feeling really quite inspired, and I'm sure that you're going to feel inspired today. So without any further ado, can we just uh, welcome Tim? Fantastic introduction, that's about it really, everybody. So, <laughs> Kia ora, good night, may your God go with you. Um, I'll, ju I'll just uh, modify one thing, and Tom wasn't to know, and it comes out, rolls out easily that way, and it depends on which art school you're in and how it works and colleges and stuff like that, but I'm going to be the, the head of department of art within Manchester School of Art, so I'm not heading up the whole School of Art, okay. thank goodness, because that's a difficult job. Penny Macbeth, if you ever watch this video. <laughs> okay, you should be my boss. Right, okay, so what I'm going to do, we've only got an hour, we've probably got slightly less than an hour, and I feel like one of those bands that have been together for 30 years plus. So I've been making art since 1986, exhibiting it, anyway, since when I was an undergraduate student, second year. You can see I'm speeding up now, right? Um, so it's a, about 30 years, and um, I feel like one of those bands where turn up and you actually can play that album, this album, 25 songs, which set list, which set list is going to be. So I'm still working out which set list this is, okay? So I thought it was really important, though, to flesh out some of the, the introduction that Tom gave. And it really is an honour to be here, actually. It's a fantastic reception. Thank you so much. Um, and so I'm going to give you a kind of very brief... Um, but possibly quite intensely brief uh, intro to how I get to be standing in here at this point, right? Okay, so then I'm going to invite some volunteers, volunteers? To uh, read some material out loud, okay? Um, and then we might, in the third <laughs> section... So he said 15 minutes long each one, right? <laughs> um, we might then listen to me reading out something that I've never read out loud before, okay? I've written it, but I've not read it out loud in, in a context like this. And then, hopefully, if it all goes to plan, there'll be 15 <coughs> minutes left at the end where you can ask me some questions, okay? And then I'll hope to be able to furnish you with the kind of answers that will make you go away feeling happy. And if not, then I don't know what the answers will be. <laughs> okay, so maybe we could dim, uh, can we dim or lower or just switch it all off? <laughs> the lights, the lights that is. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's Ooh, good. That's okay with that? I'm alright with that, are you okay with that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, right, okay, so um, I studied fine art and i um, from the northeast of England, I don't sound like it, but I am. Um, I studied fine art 
in the north of England, firstly, and then at the Slade School of Fine Art in the 1980s. I kind of finished at the Slade postgraduate, the equivalent of a master's back then, um, in 1990. And <coughs> my mum and dad had been the art teachers at the school that I went to, right? So, but they were, they were very, I would say, very good. Being a parent myself, I would say, good parenting there. Uh, what, what was good about it was that they didn't pressure me into making art at all. It was just all available, yeah? Pencils, rubbles, you, rubbers, utensils, you name it, were all there before probably spoken word was on its way. So, um, so out of the three brothers, um, being the youngest, um, I just thought, well, I'll go to art school, right? Uh, don't need any more exams. Great. <laughs> don't need to do maths. Brilliant. Um, so I did, and oh, I was working through or with sculpture, and I was working with found objects <coughs> into kind of sculptural installations. Um, and I started to replace. I started to problematize the the role of the gallery, and the function of the art object in the gallery. What I really wanted to do was to try to, it's a kind of naive aspiration, but it got me somewhere. What I wanted to do was to try and, and, and cut out all of those uh, uh, aspects which I believed were in the way, right? I don't necessarily believe they're in the way now, but I thought they were in the way. I wanted to get to a kind of live, dynamic situation with people, visitors, and, and I also problematized, wanted to problematise the idea of the audience. There you all are, all quiet, receiving it. But it doesn't mean that you're not critical, I know that. But I wanted to break it down, so I wanted to turn things around a little bit. So I started to um, present myself in, in situations where you can see that um, you know, the body starts to replace certainly here, here and over here, took a war going on, with somebody over there going that way. Um, the body, the idea of the body starts to replace the conventional art object. Now this wasn't a new thing then in the 1980s, it's been going on for a very long time, so I wasn't inventing anything new, but I was bringing myself into that tradition of work. Um, but then increasingly, I started to problematise this body centeredness and so I would invite um, the visitors yeah, to read things out and to do things in different parts of the room simultaneously to deflect away from the image of my own body and to create a situation where perhaps there would be a kind of debate a controversy, something needed to be worked through yeah often around current issues, topical issues. <coughs> okay, so um, I had this uh, habit of um, not repeating a work more than once, right? It did happen, but I, I tried to move against that idea of a rehearsal, <coughs> performance, do it again, rehearsal, performance, take it on to it. And um, I, uh, so it came to the next performance, and I thought, what am I going to do? <laughs> I'm going to take people for a walk. So I took people for a walk through East, East London, an area of East London. And um, I did a bit of scouting around before, before people turned up, like a few days before, and I kind of designed, basically. I wouldn't have thought it at the time, but I designed a route. And while I was designing the route, I was thinking about what might happen along the way. And I fell upon the idea of using quotations and reading quotations. Um, so it would be a guided walk of sorts, but it would involve quotations as opposed to the guide, who was going to be myself, identifying um, this is the parent auditorium and it was bequeathed, if you like, um, part of the family um, bequest and the name was given um, um, because
books. They could bequeath, you know, kind of do be donors to Massey University. This is the first Massey University building, etc., etc., etc. People nod their heads. They go, yeah, 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 that's pretty much right, kind of. Yeah, 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 it's sort of on the right track. I wanted to kind of replace that role of the tour guide um, with a voice, my voice, that would, that would impart material quotations from other parts of the world, other sources, other times, okay? And, and I gave myself the latitude to be able to choose texts from uh, anywhere, really, anywhere. So it could be newspapers, could be uh, bits of local history from the area, it could be something that, 15 minutes are up, uh, <laughs> something that uh, uh, somebody said in passing, it, it could be a piece of uh, fictional literature. Um, and so that's what I did. And it, it was very successful because it got to the end of this walk and I thought, how am I going to end this? Am I going to say, da -da, it's over, and everybody go, we're not going to clap, or we're going to clap and that's it? I thought, no, I'll just walk into that pub up there and I'll, I'll buy a pint of Guinness over here and, um, and they'll get the message. They all followed me in. I think they did get the message, right? They all followed me in and they, um, and they all bought a drink and they all sat down around there and I sat down. And they were all talking about stuff that had come up during the walk and I wasn't talking and they were talking and this went on for about two and a half hours and it was very engaging and I became really engaged in listening to, the, to their conversation. I suddenly realised that I'd... I'd arrived at a way of working that was producing exactly what I wanted to produce, which was this kind of debate that was live and dynamic. So, the, so I thought, right, OK, I'm going to do some more walks. <laughs> so uh, I'll do walk. I'll make walks until I wear out the form of, of making walks, until I can't find any dynamism in it anymore. And I haven't worn them out yet, for me. Okay, so taking people on guided walks, or you might call them anti-tours, <laughs> um, is something that I do, and I design, I design the route. I bring to bear on the route about 14 quotations along the way, and I read them out. And there are kind of modifications on that form along the way, but I won't, I won't, I won't go into, I won't go into that too much. So, um, whoa, 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 slow down. Yeah, so I, out of that I make guidebooks as well. Sometimes the guidebooks arrive before the walk's performed, and at other times the guidebooks happen retrospectively. And sometimes the guidebooks are, in a sense, deconstructed guidebooks, so they're folders, portfolios with, with material in them. And the material consists of instructions, I know this is not clear, but it gives you an idea. An instruction, you know, turn left at, at uh, Palmerston North Square on the whatever site. You know, have to be clear about which bit of the square to be at. And turn left, stand at this point and read quote number 20 or whatever. Well, it won't be 20 because 14. So read quote number 8 or something. And here's the quote. So it gives you a sense of purpose within the guided walk. And then the quote might appear to be very different to the thing that you're being asked to look at. But over time, through the walk, there are these assemblages of thoughts that start to appear that are the third thing. I take this thing and that thing to look at, and I collide them, and a third thing might happen, which is this thought process that's going on. And I can't control that completely, because you bring what you bring to the walk in terms of your own experience, background, ideology, ideology, etc. And these walks have then walked out of contemporary art and into other discourses, right? For example, they then become part of History Workshop Journal and um, Visual Studies and uh, Cultural Geographies and Architectural jour Journal. So they've had this ability to begin to have a dialogue with other experts in other areas, all right? Which is uh, very interesting, because you build a network of, of, of 
diverse people. This is kind of like a collegiate idea. It's a bit like a university, really. Gone wrong. Or gone <laughs> right. Okay, also, I was working with found objects. We went back to that time. And um, I was also working with found images. So this is a sequence uh, that I started in 1990 of photographs, performances, books, etc., sculptures, sound works that have ranged over a broad area but all contained within the idea of the title Fortress Europe. Fortress Europe was a term that was coined in the late 1980s before the European Union was put together in its, in its kind of current form of, in 1992. And it was a kind of left-wing argument that said, if you do this, if you create a kind of super state, it might be great for the people that live in it, especially if you've got a British passport and you're white and you're a bloke. Uh, but it might not be very good, and I'm being very kind of flippant here, it might be very bad for those that want to gain access who are on the periphery, who are outside of Europe. So you, create, you potentially create the terms of a fortress. So this sequence of works, I tell you, people would just go, yeah, okay, making that artwork, yeah, yeah, I'm still making that artwork, okay. And when Brexit happened, I'm in trouble, I tell you. It's not popular. Right. Anyway, uh, I lived in France and made a sequence of um, 32 photographs, all from one uh, historic historical image, so an image that I'd found in the Imperial War Museum in London um, that was had an an anonymous photographer to it, so there was no name given given to the photographer. That's because the British Army in the First World War didn't have names for their photographers. So all of the images are pretty much anonymous, well, many of them. Um, And I kind of dissembled this photograph and created... um, a range of sort of portrait-sized images from this one photograph, making sculptures in the Fortress Europe sequence. And I talked a little bit about this in the image before. Uh, this was in Holland, and on on the Kent, on the Kent, which is on the back wall there, means um, kind of unknown. So some of the graveyards in Holland that were involved in both wars, but certainly the Second World War around Arnhem, a lot of the gravestones have Ombekent written on them because they don't know who's buried there. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to do an, uh, we're going to try just for a little bit, maybe ten minutes, an iteration of this work here, which is a f- part of the Fortress Europe sequence, and it's called. The Fourth Front, Voices for Texts, Texts for Transmission. So we're going to almost transmit, well we are going to transmit, but um, some of these voices. So if we could have the lights on, that would be good, so people can see what we're going to read. And this this text came out of, is is the... it came out of a journey that I made in the 1990s. In fact, I'll tell you what I did. 93, I made the journey. And um, I spent a long time afterwards kind of working with the texts that I'd made on the journey. And the journey was a hitchhike from Switzerland to Istanbul, and then hired a car and drove around basically a kind of perimeter within the confines of Turkey then, so up into Armenia and into through aspects of Kurdistan um, at a time that was shortly after the first Gulf War. Okay. So I need a range of volunteers okay, who are going to they're going to stand out here like a choir. We're going to form a choir. And we're going to be reading aloud 
the first person will start to read and they'll feel very self-conscious because they'll be the only one only ones reading aloud, right? And then after a very short period of time, literally less than a minute, less than a minute, the second person will start to read, so you'll have two voices, and then the third person will start to read, then everybody will start to feel comfortable because it'll get very noisy, right? And you can hide in the noise. Yeah? So you don't want to hide in the noise. <laughs> so it's perfect. So I need some more volunteers for this to work. This is going to be yours. Don't start reading yet. What's your name? Morgan. Excellent. And this is the second voice. We're not going to do all 22 voices. People are running away. Oh, no, they're not. They're coming towards me. They're coming towards me. Very good. Let me just give you the rest of the second voice. Same voice. And your name is? Nikita. I may forget these things. No, that's okay. India. India. And look shorter than the others. But it probably is. It's just the way I've laid it out. Okay. And don't worry, it'll be fine. Don't worry. We'll all be good. We'll all work out. Fourth voice is very good. Tim, do you still need more volunteers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm almost good. I've got some ideas. Yeah. I'm almost good. Yeah. See, maybe if we had two here, that'd be good. We could put the t we could put two on chairs. One chair, and there's another chair. So this will be the fifth and the sixth voice. Yeah, six is good. Six is good. Now all numbers are magic, but seven seems to have a kind of curiosity. Uh, I think it's important that it's not me, actually, for the purposes of this. Oh, brilliant. Right, fifth voice. Superb. And your name is? Zach. Zach. Interpret the spacing and the dots in any way you want to. You haven't got any. <laughs> Alright then. Activity at short range. Cumuline nimbus, cloud formation moving from the west. Slowly. Slowly obscures the sunlight and passes out of sight. Light pours out through the windows and over the sink. Linoleum and matting. Zero, six, zero. Five nine, five eight, five seven, five six, fifteenth of a five five, class five rising four, steadily, five, five three, prophesied, five two, a few drops of five one in the morning, five zero, but the day was fine, four nine, sunny intervals, four eight, observation, four good. seven, 
four six. Five six four five. Stop October. Four, four, All remaining four, villages four, declared four, out of bounds for security, security reasons four, two, will be considered as control, areas one, containing one, savages, four, zero, comma, agents, and traitors. Three nine. Nine. There is no memory, eight, only sound. Three stop. seven. There is no sound. Stop. Three six. No humans, no or animals are allowed in that area. Stop. Shooting is restricted in these areas. Three one. Unless on orders issued by us, stop. No defense. Two nine. The whole process is serious. Stop. 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 Stop.
Yes. A temporary home. This is a temporary home. So increasing the hundreds of white, hundreds of white working class, out temporarily, temporarily installed. As opposed to gone the old, the old school. And the old school. And to reconcile that, so with me, with that with me. Microwaves, um, okay beds, televisions, so, um, generators, I, um, barbecues. I've been working. Lightning. On this text beds, called Upon robots, Palmyra. Books, tables, I'm chairs, going to tell you a little bit about the context lighting, of it. Um, where I'm from in, in, in the northeast of England, it is near the Scottish border, it is difficult. Uh, it is difficult the Romans not, had a, it is a war difficult not the Hadrian's to, Wall. It is difficult it's basically the, the northernmost cynical, limit cynicism of does not imply the Roman Empire. Tendency. We did go a bit further up. A Lasted about four years. School. Had a wooden I, uh, stockade. I can see Couldn't you. Handle it. But you have got to stand anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, Hedgen's <laughs> walls are pretty much this kind of the sustained. But this bit. is. But this is a it's kind of our end of the Vince, empire. Vince, you know, Vince, 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 survey. Survey. A city north today, actually, the weather. Um, and total. Um, don't tell you. Lots of different people were sent there don't tell you as you part of the Roman. Military, so yeah, when driving, like necessarily, hours, you know, what you think about Italians from Rome. Obviously, Italy didn't exist then. And signs um, bearing optics. You'd have military passing on the people from the conquest and secret areas that had been order, block, brought okay, into the empire. Chick, chick point, ah, so you'd have Spanish, chick, you'd have uh, we have the North Africa. Powers. In Newcastle on the Tyne is a little town called South Shields, and in South Shields there was a Roman fort, and uh, it's now a museum called Arbea. And in Arbea, there is a, 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 a tomb, a tombstone, a headstone to a, to a tomb, a stele, it'd be in Latin. And um, it's, it's to uh, a woman called Regina. And Regina or Regina um, means queen quality. And this stone was erected by her husband, who was called Baratis. And he was clearly a man of names because um, there'd been something to erect to him. And he must have had affection for her of a particular kind because these kinds of tombs are not necessarily not tombstones, just, uh, uh, memorials, not necessarily yeah. readily available. Yeah. And it turns out that in the inscription, that this is the inscription here. This is the inscription here. It says, um, is illuminated by light. To the spirits of so the departed here. and to Regina, his free experience. woman and wife, Baratis, a Palmyrene, and <coughs> set this up. Regina was a Tatuvulani by tribe, aged 30. Uh, Regina, the free woman of Baratis, alas. So Regina had been a British, if you like, British Celt. She'd been a slave, she'd married Baratis. Uh, Baratis had married her, Out but clearly there was something more complicated than a marriage of convenience with a slave because of the dynamic here. The I would think I might be wrong. The stack. Okay. Bundled, bundled together. Um, just up, then along the wall, uh, was a fort called uh, Corbridge. It's the town of Corbridge now. And in their museum is uh, a fragment of a memorial stone. Um, and it's Baratis' this memorial stone. Trying to find some and this is, this is what's left. Out of sight but they care. know, the archaeologists know on the balance right. of probabilities that it was one right. part right. of uh, an ostentatious right. um, memorial. Files. So Baratis, who was the man of money, Baratis, who was the man of money, had quite a humble distance. burial, Circle and he honoured his wife, who had been a British slave, moving, moving Celtic up, slave, moving up with, a um, with a, with a horses, quite horses, a grand beautiful. So I thought this was interesting, this is my kind of home circle, area, really. Dark circle, 
and Newcastle, which is just north of where I'm from in Sunderland, is on the River Tyne, which is where Hadrian's Wall comes out from the River Tyne and toss to the west coast. So we have a Palmyra. I thought that's interesting. Baratis was from Palmyra. What was he doing on the River Tyne? He's not a soldier. He's not a soldier. This is Palmyra in Syria. Fabulous Roman remains. It was a huge center. It was an oasis in the middle of the desert. Just going to have an aside here. James. the empire from the east to the west and, and vice versa. So it came under the um, it came under um, ISIS, the control of ISIS. Um, really formally we should call it Daesh D A E S H. Um, and of course what Daesh did and you, you may know this um, <coughs> is that they destroyed um, we thought they destroyed everything, but actually they didn't destroy everything, but they destroyed the major aspects of the, of the amphitheatre. It was a huge amphitheatre. Um, as, as a statement, you know, a symbolic statement. So... flavor of something. I'm not going to read it all. I'm going to give you a flavor of this sequence. So I wrote a sequence of poems called Upon Palmyra. Palmyra. And the, the first entry of text or first poem in the sequence is called Upon Palmyra. Gold streams down and Jacob's laddering with rungs wrought by cloud. It lands on western hills and flows across the wadi following the course of day towards oasis gardens search of palms upon Palmyra. Bathing Baal, sun of sky, warm columns and flag waiting on the warmth. Shards and long shadows cast stone spectrums into sculpture, now ghosted in brief testimony of Aramaeon, Amorite, Arab, Jew, burnishing this clock face of the Limes, gold streams down in silken thread, unraveling to nightscapes of laser sightings and infrared. Now, the sequence of poems takes you through what, in my mind, is a my imagination is the relationship between Baratis and Regina and it postulates, it puts forward the idea that Baratis was a boatman his skill was in navigating the Euphrates right? which, which is the major kind of uh, delta of, of river system in Syria and he would have been really good at that as a boatman. So why? So they would need boatmen up in the northern part of the empire in order to move stones to the area 
up the river time to build the wall. Okay. And likewise then take stuff back. Yeah, I don't know what maybe slaves, I don't know. And it also postulates where Regina came from. Now we know that she's part of the Catavaluni tribe. So we know that the Romans that they were related to the Iceni tribe, which is, you've heard of Bodicea maybe, but Boudicca really is how I would say it, Boudicca, Boudicca, queen of the Iceni. And it goes through um, the, the fact that the Romans did document, it's well documented that they took her daughters and raped her daughters, and that's really what kind of pushed her into that mode of non-negotiable revenge response. Um, and then it ends with a quote from the independent uh, newspaper, which is a broadsheet newspaper like The Guardian. I'm not going to read the quote because it's a long quote. What it is is an obituary um, from Friday the 21st of August 2015. Um, just read the headline. Khaled al-Assad, authority on the antiquities of the Syrian city of Palmyra, who was devoted to studying and protecting its treasures. Al-Assad was murdered by ISIS operatives after he refused to disclose where the city's treasures were hidden. Whatever happens, he told a friend, I cannot go against my conscience. So they took, so he wouldn't leave, and they took Al-Assad, and they took him into the Roman amphitheatre, like they took many people into the Roman amphitheatre, and they beheaded him in the Roman amphitheatre. 